Ah, enjoy a physics video. Yay. Um, anyway, um, so I have been working on um, trying to diagram the arguments um, pointing out the weakness of the conveniently held or conventionally held theory. Okay, the whatever it is, the standard bought into stuff. Um, you know, so and so, uh, you know, trying to isolate the subjects that are relevant and um, what really hasn't been demonstrated by any kind of reliable um, collection of evidence. So, in a, if you were thinking about this as a type of a trial, um, what's being pointed out, I'm going to point out in some sort of closing argument or some sort of just argument in the case. But these questions, until they're answered, um, there's no case because there's no evidence besides the assertions of a scientist. And that's all there are. It's just their assertions that we think it happens this way or we hope it happens this way. But there's no evidence that it happens in these ways at all. And this goes all the way back to the two-slit experiment and lots of other stuff. So the uh, I'm going to get to this article that um, dissident science guy, uh, David D. Hilster, um, did a video because somebody pointed him to it. But it's an article from January 2003. And it's very funny how they point out how, well, you know, we won't really know the speed of light until uh, they detect gravitational waves. Uh, I don't know how exactly those uh, enable you to determine the speed of light when you're making up the location they're coming from. I mean, it's all just made up. Um, and um, so anyway, it was really bad science. But you know, so my, I guess to the bad science part here. So this is from January 2003, a silly titled article, you know, first speed of gravity measurement revealed. So you go to the actual content of this, you know, nonsense, and it's, it's just, this isn't anything close to being scientific. Um, I don't even know how this stuff gets published. It's so bad. So <clears throat> the experiment's premise was they're going to use radio waves, <laughs> and they're detecting a quasar, and they're letting Jupiter lens it. Now, I've brought up the subject of using Jupiter to lens. And <clears throat> so we don't have any evidence that you can do that, that there's enough gravity. It's a lot of gravity. So, you know, a quarter of the sun's gravity, something like that. Not bad. Um, and... Um, but the problem is, is how thick is the atmosphere, you know, and how far away are you from the real mass, you know, in terms of the inverse square law degrading the gravity too much to be able to bend light, are radio waves. So in this case, they're using radio waves. And so the catch with radio waves is it's not an image. You're not looking at something and seeing it. You're seeing uh, a lot less detail, a lot less. And so what you're really doing is detecting any signature from the thing at all. And so the experiment was basically the quasar, it, the radio waves get lensed by Jupiter, and they're showing it out here. But obviously what's really happening is the lensing is happening in the atmosphere of Jupiter. And it's not lensing, it's scatter. And then there's an image, and what they're saying is happening, that Jupiter's gravity is distorting the image. So here's a premise again, never, no theoretical basis for this premise that you can take the image that was lensed and it gets distorted when it has to travel through the gravity. So they're saying it not only got bent here, but it got warped as it traveled through Jupiter's gravity. Now that premise isn't true in the Eddington experiment, the most famous <laughs> lensing experiment ever. There was no assumption that the gravity that the sun was radiating, or whatever it does, uh, somehow distorted the view of the suns, besides moving their position, that it would also distort them. So there's two claims being made here. And the joke of this whole thing, right, the thing that just makes it so obviously idiotic, is when you get to the little bit of the details, so, so they could, I guess they couldn't find any other use for this experiment because the data was so vague. Like I say, I would argue it was just scattered. The light gets scattered, radio waves get scattered, so you can sort of measure the time delay. 
because you get the light a little bit earlier than you should because it's going through the atmosphere and getting bent. All right, well, anyway, um, it's getting bent in lots of directions and you're getting some of the signal back. But the real joke was, okay, from that, they worked out that gravity does move the same speed as light. So, so they did their experiment and they say it moves the same speed. But this is based on, listen to this. Their actual figure was 0.95 times the speed of light, but with a large error margin of plus or minus 25%. So if their results were anywhere from three quarters of the speed of light or 1.25% of the speed of light, that is, you know, 3 million... 500,000 meters per second, that would have been okay. That would have been the same as they measured the exact speed of light. So they have a margin of error of 20, 25%. And then they claim they actually measured something relevant, like we got the right answer. And they have a preposterous margin of error. So anything within the realm of, of you know, it, it, this, if they would have measured the speed of light at, at 2,500,000 meters per second, or... 3,500,000 meters per second. Anywhere in that range, they would have said, we have first, first people to measure the actual speed of light. A an amazingly idiotic claim. I mean, how can you call this science? You, you have a 25% margin of error. <laughs> well, what, what science can you do with that size of margin of error? But what 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 of what use or value can you can can the results be? And you publish them as if something real happened, when nothing real happened here. This is garbage, as evidence. If you have a twenty five percent margin of error, your your evidence is garbage. It's you can't use it in court. It's like getting the testimony of a retarded two year old. It just doesn't make any sense. So anyway, so just more evidence of how science has no intent. New scientist publishes a piece of crap, this steaming. First speed of gravity measurement revealed. They're claiming they measured the speed of gravity. I, should, I said light, but I meant gravity. And, <laughs> and they have a 25% margin of error. Come on. That doesn't fall into the two fucking silly category. <sighs> Shit. All right. So anyway, that's point one. Um, just want to get that out of the way. Um, so the subjects I'm going to deal with so far. Like I said, I would like somebody to comment if there's something else I got to deal with. I didn't really put relativity on the list because I don't think relativity is one theory. And I think it's just a a bunch of stuff cobbled together. So I'd say the the idea that um, velocity and, and the relationship to time retardation or time uh, dilation, that's a separate thing all by itself. You know, what velocity does to the function of matter is a separate question. You don't need relativity for that. I mean, it doesn't have to be connected, certainly. I mean, it's a conversation where the theory itself has nothing to do with it, in a sense. I'm arguing, certainly. Um, and then when you get into the rest of the relativistic stuff, it just has to do with people speculating about what happens when you approach the speed of light or some large percentage of the speed of light. And I don't think they have any evidence of what happens under those circumstances at all to what's called regular matter. That is, matter made of electrons and protons. Now, what happens to electrons and protons, that's another subject. All right. So I just don't think it's a... It's, it's not a, one theory. It's a bunch of little stuff tied together. Um, I'd argue that the idea, okay, that gravity... Einstein um, assuming that it's the, the logical correctness of establishing that gravity moves at a speed and it's not instantaneous was not brilliant. He wasn't the first person to think of that. Lots of people before Einstein had already thought of that. And the only thing that Einstein brought to the table was an understanding that gravity is inductive in the sense that each body is creating gravity 
in each body is being affected by gravity. So it's not just some collective thing that happens. It's a thing that happens to individual bodies and they react as individuals. I mean, obviously that ends up with being a dance, but it's a dance they're not doing. There's no, there's no strings tying them together. The string has to be their interaction and their interactions have to take place at the speed of light, not instantaneously. And so that explains the procession of Mercury and some other things. And those are valid elements. But the invalid elements are the wrong identification of the cause of the convergence that's gravity. All right. And certainly the effects of velocity on material function don't have to have anything to do with relativity. Um, so anyway, so I didn't include it, but I probably should now that I've talked about it. Um, so I got LIGO, you know, gravity waves. That's the one I'm working on first. And then there'll be gravitational lensing. There'll be the idea of space expansion or the, the problem of redshift, which, you know, it has to, it has to be explained. But I think this, I think it's a little bit stupid for the explanation to be that there's a bunch of new space being created between all of the photon waves and that's making them further apart because you'd have to have all that space expansion happening inside every atom and it, you know I, I can't see how that couldn't create tons of problems in terms of the function of matter so I just think it's wrong-headed as an explanation um, then the two-slit experiment um, and if somebody knows of some other experiment that is relevant to um, diffraction or probability, um, like Einstein, I mean, uh, like uh, Newton's glass experiments or something, if somebody has some some evidence or theory uh, connected to that or subject connected, um, you know, that I should point out why the conclusions drawn from certain experiments are. Um, premature and um, almost unsupported completely as is all the theory behind gravitational waves there's just no theoretical basis um, in the sense that there's no there's no evidence defending any element of what's claimed to be the truth so all right, so I start off saying uh, what corroborating evidence supports any element of the theory. And um, so we first can start off with, okay, the idea of what's being produced is a wave of what? Of gravitational radiation? I mean, we don't even have a way of describing what, these, what this wave is of, except that it has some material impact in the sense that when it hits a planet, it's going to shake it you know, billions of years later, enough for us to hear it. That's the premise. So there's some sort of energy. So I don't know how to <coughs> appropriately define this gravity wave um, radiation thingy, um, except in terms that, like I say, they use, which, you know, what what is it? All right. So... <coughs> And then what, what the idea of a, so, so we're starting with two black holes in a binary system. That's the start of their theory. I mean, first we don't even really have a good proof of a black hole. But let's just say that black holes with 30 of solar, thir, bit massive black holes, 30 solar masses in the black hole. I mean, it's massive by the, by, by, <laughs> certainly by our standards. <clears throat> Obviously they can conceive of black holes that have thousands of solar masses worth of energy, which seems quite preposterous to me. But anyway, so we don't have any, which, where's the evidence? What piece of physical evidence demonstrates the existence of binary black holes? That is two black holes spinning around each other. Um, then what evidence is there corroborating the idea of two black holes actually colliding into each other? And then what's the evidence of a black hole moving anywhere near the speed of light are moving very very fast so it's a hugely massive object and just understand for it to have velocity you can't just get that for free 
There's no free source of velocity. You have to take it from something else. So <laughs> what initiated that function? How is it possible in a binary system not to just degrade both of your masses by rotating? Because you're just basically pulling each other's, you're just stealing each other's energy. He pulls you one way, you pull him the other way, you push him, it's a push-pull thing. You can't, you know, where do you get that energy from? And just understand that everything that we move in the real world, we have to push with energy. And so black holes don't move for free. So where did all the energy come from for the black hole to have a velocity? Um, so this is part of the problem, that there's just no, there, there's no analysis of consequences. So all of these theories have theoretical consequences. So the theory of gravitational lensing has consequences, and there's no analysis of how the environmental circumstances, the evidence of what exists, in any way fits with what the consequences of their theory being true is. So let's take the consequences of this theory being true seriously, and then you come up with all kinds of problems. So the big one is the theory necessary for them. See, this device can only work if you make something preposterously loud. You have to have an incredible energy impact for this device to do anything in terms of viewing the cosmos. It's not like a telescope, you know, where it can just pick out a few photons and, and resolve an image. It has to get hit by a ton of photons. So many photons, so much energy, gravity tons, whatever you want to call them, an equal amount. If you were to convert the gravitational radiation, the wave, into its energy equivalent of photons, it would be an incredibly bright light that hit the Earth. Not a, not a little light. I mean, a light so bright it would have caught everything on fire. That's how strong the wave had to be when it got here. It had to be billions and zillions and zillion gazillions of photons that hit the Earth if it was converted into any other energy we know. If it was converted into radiation, you know, um, you know, the toxic kind, you know, we all would have been irradiated to death. It had, it was such, such a powerful energy impact. So they convert into this invisible thing to make it benign, like it wasn't much energy at all when it was a huge amount of energy. So if it was any other form, it would have burned us all to a cinder. And so what we don't have is like data like that. So if that signal is what they claim it to be, what, what local event, how big a local event would you have to have to make the same signal? Would the moon have to blow up? I mean, how big of an energy event would have to take place in our local environment to have the same vibrational effect on the planet Earth? I mean, just when you just apply a little bit of logic, you can just see this can't possibly make sense. We can see much better than we can hear, and we can certainly see with a telescope much better than we can hear the universe by putting our ear to the ground, you know, even with a megaphone. I mean, it's a silly concept that we're going to hear the energy, you know, or that we can hear, you know, vibrations in the earth better than we can see photons in space. It's nonsensical rubbish. All right, so anyway, so we have as a premise of this theory, a thing I never saw defended anywhere, I keep, you know, I just to put an open thing, please, somebody who sees, somebody who knows where you can source this, this logical proof demonstrating the theoretical viability of this notion that you can convert matter into bent space-time. That somehow the thing that makes planets move into each other, that force, that thing, is somehow created by destroying matter. You destroy three solar masses in this collision, 
and those three solar masses are converted not into any kind of energy we know, any no kind of radiation, no electromagnetic radiation, no um, magnetism, no electricity. It's no, it's converted into some kind of profile in the bent space continuum or something, whatever that is. The field of bent space gets a huge bubble in it, either a depression or a lump. And that lump travels through space and gets to the Earth five billion light years away and shakes it enough for us to hear the difference between being on the side that got shook and, or the side that didn't get shook. All right, something that loud, that intrusive. Now, do we have any evidence that this did anything else to all the other matter that was within a billion light years? That wouldn't just get a sunburn. They would have gotten, you know, knocked to pieces by this tsunami. So essentially this is a tsunami. Three billion, I mean, three solar masses converted into com co complete energy in a millisecond. So the entire lifetime of the energy production, the possible energy production, that means every ounce of it, is converted into energy in a millisecond. So that's more light than you see in the universe, looking in the sky. It's, <laughs> there's no way to even describe how powerful that is, because even things like supernovas, only like one percent of the matter is converted into the explosion. Most of the matter gets gets knocked away as little flying bits. It doesn't get converted into energy. It gets moved by the energy of the conversion. So it's only a tiny percentage of the actual sun's energy that's released in a solar in, in a supernova. One of the most dramatic things we've observed. And that's only a tiny percentage of the sun's energy. We're talking about the entire lifetime of a sun, that is all the billions of years it burns, plus the complete conversion of all of its leftover mass after it's done burning. We're talking about a huge amount of energy. And we're supposed to believe that was released in one location in space. Now, I, I should draw a picture of it. I can find a piece of paper. Uh. This will do. Printer test. Anyway, uh, you know, it's a little tricky getting the printer to work on Linux. Anyway, you know, I had to use an Apple uh, application to make it work. It's kind of you know, we got to do something about that. Anyway, um, <laughs> you know, I shouldn't have to use Apple. It's like going for Mike to Microsoft for help. Eee. Anyway, all right, so we have these, these you know, here's, we'll just say this piece of paper is space. You know, we have this little location in space, and it's like got all these stars and galaxies and nebulas and all kinds of shit all over the place. And here we are, five billion light years away, and there was this explosion here, so colossal, three solar masses in one millisecond released as pure and a form of energy as you can get. So it was like just pure ultraviolet light or cosmic rays or whatever you want to think of it in terms of pure hard energy release in this gigantic huge tsunami. So obviously close to this thing everything should have just been spread out like this. For us to feel it here it had to be three solar masses like I said, converted in an instant. There'd be evidence of the evacuation of the space. <clears throat> then, on top of that, you know, let's put two theories together. So we have this gigantic, so let's say the wave gets to us finally. You know, it's got a much bigger arc now. It's way over here. Okay, and it gets to us. The trick is, this thing has been traveling through space for five billion years. This tsunami of... of bent space of gravitational radiation. And this is the very stuff that's supposed to be bending light for gravitational lensing. So why wouldn't this wave bend light? Light, If light was a photon was traveling and it hit this wave, 
why wouldn't this wave knock the crap out of that photon? And consider there's, there's views we would have that are right through the crest of the wave. It goes through the wave twice. And those views are still out there. This wave is still moving. Okay, it's still, it's still, ha it's still here. And right now we could have, we could look at angles where we would still have to go right through the wave twice. Well, I don't know about twice anymore. Let's just see. Uh, yeah, well, that would be on the other side. So it depends on the angle. But the point is, is the wave is still moving and we can still see things lensed by it. It's still out there bending and pushing. So why don't we see it? Why can't we find that little burp in, in where the photons got bent? They're at the wrong trajectory. We're going to see things in the wrong location because they went, this wave thing is, is going to interfere with them. And we can go any place to look for that. We can just figure, we can approximate where the wave is, where it hit us, and we can approximate locations that should change substantially um, for a moment. Anyway, it doesn't make any logical sense. But what's the defense for any of this? Fast moving black holes, conversion of matter to bent space, what other piece of evidence verifies any of that? So they just made up, a, in my opinion, they contrived an energy event merely to defend the function of this device, which would have no function without this contrived huge energy. They have to create something that makes such a colossal noise and somehow it does it far enough away so we can't see it and it can't blow us up. Because it's such a big event. If it happened locally, it would have killed us. So they you know, <laughs> they have to make it very far away. Because you can't make a local event that is proportionally as aggressive as this wave had to be. So, you know, for it to get here. So this is this is just this is a, this is just a story told. And they gave Nobel Prizes for telling this story. But without any corroboration, how do you defend this as good science? I mean, not any, any corroboration for a single element. Where's the corroboration? What other experiment demonstrates bent space being created by the destruction of matter? What other, what other experiment demonstrates that? What other experiment demonstrates black holes moving at three quarters or 89% of or 99% of the speed of light? What experiment demonstrates that? So they just make this stuff up, and you just everybody they you sit around and you applaud. They made up this theory, and it it confirms nothing, it establishes the truth of nothing, and it's completely circular reasoning. This you know, I had a theory. Uh, I decided what I would look for. Uh, and I found exactly what I was looking for, but what I was looking for was something of my own description. I went in looking for, um, you know, the the very event that I'm supposed to be proving. Well, I, I didn't say that correctly, but I'm just saying you go in with a model, and then you make the experiment create your model. And that's all they did. They just wait for noises that match the profile of what they have, you know, contrived as an event that would be hearable. And it doesn't, you know, but there's no real rule saying this is, um, I don't know how to put it. Um, there's, there's nothing demonstrating that they already didn't know what sounds the earth was making. And they just contrived f events to fit the profile of the noises the earth makes at all, no evidence at all. Because it seems it seems to me quite unlikely that somebody going in would invent um, this kind of thing as being the thing they would hear. I mean if we want to speculate about something happening, you might even speculate about a single black hole exploding or 
you know, some kind of more local event that you could possibly hear. But to contrive one that must happen billions of light years away, because that's the only way you can't see it. The only way you can't see the effects of the amount of energy you're claiming is being absorbed by the Earth from outer space. So they're claiming a huge amount of energy was absorbed by the Earth, and they don't have to account for all the effects it would have if it was real energy, if it was photons. Yeah. If it was photons, how bright would the light be? That would be the question to ask. The gravity wave, in terms of the amount of energy that hit the Earth, if it was in regular light photons, how bright would that light have to be to shake the Earth? That's the question. And obviously the answer is way too bright. Insanely bright. <laughs> yeah. Something never seen before. Because you, you couldn't, you know, you'll be dead, so you can't write it. I saw, you won't be able to write it down, but you'll be dead. Anyway. Um, oh, hot as hell. I put on a shirt for decency's sake. It's just too heavy a shirt. <laughs> so anyway. Um, right, so those will be the subjects, and this will be the points I'll make in the argument. So this isn't the official gravitational waves video, but I just wanted to get a start on it to get a to get a little more enthusiastic about having to write all this crap because I really don't like writing anything. Um, and nobody answered any of the questions in my previous video where I listed a bunch of arguments um, related to the radar uh, diffraction bullshit. So, but I guess just for posterity's sake, I'll just have the questions out there and they're left open to anyone who defends um, this conventional science and um, wishes to defend the integrity of it by explaining exactly how they have evidence of any of this stuff or any of the necessary components of evidence, which are corroboration, how any of this is substantially evidence-based when I would argue it's just substantially um, uh, bravado, arrogance, and elitism. There's, there's, there's no, you know, they convince somebody to spend billions of dollars to make a detector um, to find a silly thing, and then they found the silly thing, they claim. And that's all there is here, is the claim by people getting paid to find silly things saying they found silly things. But there's no science here, is there? by the definition of what science should be, which is this rigorous attempt to corroborate and um, substantiate and make uh, qualitatively legitimate your evidence. I mean, is that what science is supposed to do, is make good arguments, not arg the argument from hearsay? Isn't this a hearsay argument? Isn't gravitational waves hearsay evidence and here you are committing physics to another theory, like gravitational lensing. You're just committing it to another whole pile of theoretical truth that will, in my opinion, that's wrong-headed and is just going to get you doing a bunch of wrong science and investing in um, experiments that can't hope to do anything productive. <sighs> yeah, so that's probably enough. Um, yeah. I'll leave it there. So, until the next time and such. I'm working on it. Like I say, then I'll put it on the message board and do whatever I can to try to put a bunch of statements together explaining the weakness of these arguments made in defense of these fundamental theories about how the universe works. And the, and the argument being made by these gravitational wave supporters is somehow they've proven that matter can be converted into gravity waves, <laughs> bent space. And there's no evidence that you can do that. There's no evidence that the matter creates gravity. As I've pointed out before, it's quite obvious to most you know, people logically, you just do the addition, there's no mathematics required to explain that how the Earth is depleting its, its matter by creating gravity or how the sun is getting weaker because it's creating gravity. 
the earth doesn't get less material, doesn't use its matter to pull the moon towards it. And the moon doesn't lose its matter to pull the earth towards it. There's no connection between mass and gravity other than an indirect one. You can't convert mass into gravity. It's theoretically um, incoherent. It's incoherent with logic to see any connection between the two. This clearly matter makes gravity not by expending itself but by existing. Matter doesn't make gravity by being destroyed. Matter makes gravity by existing as matter. It's like a magnet is a magnet as long as it's made of the chemistry of a magnet. But if you break its chemistry or you change its configuration, it's not a magnet anymore. You can't convert the magnet into energy. You can't convert its magnetism into energy. It either has the feature of being magnetic or it doesn't have the feature. But you can't use energy as a go-between in terms of creation of magnetism. You know, besides running electricity through wires and whatnot. But, like I said, obviously, there's no, there's no consumption in the process of a magnet being a magnet. It's not consuming the material substance to be magnetic. Anyway, that seems a long way to say <laughs> there's no theoretical basis for assuming that if you revert matter to some primordial form that that form would be it's now gravity. There's certainly reason for me to believe it because I believe in a, a real conservation. So it's the same as any kind of other energy. But again, it's the same as any other kind of energy. That is, you can't create gravitational waves without them having a physical effect on their surroundings that would be just as impactful as if they were photons. Okay. Being hit by an extra wave of gravity would could potentially, in many respects, um, have just as severe an impact on you as being exposed to ultraviolet light, for example, if it really happened. Anyway, that's enough said. Um, yeah, well, I already said that was enough said. Uh, so anyway, what I'm working on anyway. So, till next time. Such.